Okay. So welcome to the fourth day of the boot camp. Uh, it's the grand finale. We're gonna kind of uh, wrap up the three sessions and then uh, talk about uh, the final lab and the case study today. I'll just talk others. <coughs> Okay, so uh, as we have uh, discussed in the last, we'll just give, uh, give you a quick overview of what we have been doing in the past three days. On day one, we got an orientation on you know, what FinTech is about, and uh, uh, from uh, Dushyan, uh, he kind of talked about uh, FinTech 2020 and the State of the Union. We talked about capital markets and blockchain on day one. On day two, uh, we got some insights on InsureTech, and then we talked about AI, big data, and analytics. And then I gave you a demo of uh, the sentiment analyzer. On day three, I mean, we talked about robo advisors, and then uh, we had uh, Darshak give a view on fintech and emerging markets, particularly uh, from India. And uh, we also took, uh, took a look at how do you build out a robo advisor and what are the various components involved, and how do you build out the whole pipeline in order to roll back an application deck. So in today's session, as you can observe, like you know, many of the sessions you're going to be seeing today, we'll be uh, having a theme on payments and lending. And uh, we're going to focus on these two topics, and we'll do a case study on how you build out a whole application for uh, uh, current risk. So in case you have historical data, and uh, we are going to be using the lending pool data set, which is publicly available. And if you wanted to take that data set and then build a credit risk model, say, okay, if I know what uh, kinds of profiles we've been seeing and uh, what kind of interest rates people have been getting, can we build out a model which can mimic what Lending Club uses for digital lending? Okay, so that's gonna be uh, the focus for today. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do is uh, talk a little bit about payments and kind of give you an overview of some of the innovations which are happening in the payment space. And then I'm gonna give you an orientation of lending and then we will jump into the lab. So the lab component, uh, we will obviously require you to do some hands-on work. And uh, in order to just facilitate that, I'm gonna give you a demo today, and it'll also be recorded, as you know. And what we will do is uh, we'll give you, uh, we'll send you an email with access to the platform, and that platform will let you log in remotely. It's all running on the cloud. You don't have to be there in person. You can log in remotely and then run the case study. So I have two flavors of the same application. Flavor one is for people who are predominantly technologists, who like to do hands-on coding, who like to work with their Python and work with a lot of data. For them, we have a bunch of Jupyter notebooks you can fire up. The Jupyter notebooks are basically Python code on a web front, if you will, and you can actually see the code. You can play with the data and you can dabble with the code and understand what's actually happening. Flavor two is predominantly for professionals, financial professionals, who are predominantly going to be end users of applications and may not have a good understanding of the, of the Python or any other programming language. So there you're going to see a fully fledged, uh, flushed out app, which is for a website, but you can still invoke the various machine learning models. So you could say, you know, what in case I use neural network model, what in case I use random forest model, what in case I use a regression model. So those are the three machine learning models we're gonna talk about. And I'll give you an app, which will help you kind of get a flavor for what will the end product look like when you run this application, okay? So you'll have you know, something for, uh, for everybody. Um, so don't get scared if you see a lot of Python and you're not a uh, programmer. Okay, um, so uh, just to kind of give you an orientation, uh, the payment automation has kind of gone through excuse me, you know, whole revolution. And, you know, there, there was a nice article which talks about the evolution of FinTech and you can see, you know, we have seen various uh, innovations kind of come in every uh, decade, if you will. Uh, so you have the credit cards, the ATMs, and, you know, then you had electronic stock trading and then mainframe computers. And then 1998, PayPal, PayPal was founded. And then you have a lot of digitalization and uh, digital transformation projects happening in the financial industry. So we've seen a lot of innovations happening. And every time there was a uh, you know, major innovation, you see new crops and services come up. So specifically, what we're talking about in the context of payments 
we are seeing a lot of uh, integration of you know, devices, which you know, personal devices, which we you know normally carry nowadays. And uh, you know, on one hand, you have mobile payments. You know, we have uh, the smart uh, phone platform. Uh, Ten years ago, when the iPhone, or 10 or 15 years ago now, when the iPhone wasn't there, a phone was meant to just be a communication device for you know mostly talking or uh, even some basic SMS messaging. But now we have a whole platform built into our mobile devices, where which is predominantly used for payments. Um, and then we're also seeing a lot of streamlining of payments. You know, payment itself was an activity. Every time you wanted to do a transaction, you'd kind of you know, do, go through the whole process and then say, okay, now I'm going to go and do my payments and then pull out my credit card and uh, build out the whole thing. So that whole process is getting streamlined. And I'll give you a couple of stories just to kind of motivate that concept. And then you have integrated billing, you know, depending on where you are, you are constantly you know, geotagging location-based payment. So if you are in Europe, then predominantly the currency is going to be uh, in euros or uh, in pounds or whatever the currency there is. Uh, but then you also are seeing a lot of uh, different transactions, uh, like GIN, machine uh, payments, etc. Uh, and then you are seeing a lot of you know newer security mechanisms being enforced. You know that, that uh, you're uh, constantly seeing new innovations like biometrics being integrated. So um, the story I want to kind of you know relay is I had a, at a conference in San Francisco, and uh, when I went to San Francisco, um, I uh, uh, when I got off, got off of my flight, uh, they, the conference organizers have sent me a code, an Uber code, and they said like in order to get to your hotel location, you know, we're not going to compensate you for uh, for your travel, but here's Uber code, just use the Uber code and. You know, that's going to get you to 75 miles from the conference location, and you can go into any uh, hotel, uh, reserve any hotel, 75 miles from the conference location. And uh, you know, I didn't have to. You know, I just used the code for the like, Uber, and I just basically had to put in the location address, and then I was able to get there. So I didn't have to make any specific payments. Payments was kind of already taken care of. You know, but um, in addition to that, you know, when I attended my conference. After the conference, I had to go and eat lunch, and uh, the Amazon uh, well, the, the store was a block away, and I hadn't seen an Amazon store before, and I wanted to go and just check it out. So when I go in, I downloaded the app, just used the app to get in. How many of you visited an Amazon store before? Uh, you know, like one or two. So you know, when you go in, you just you know put in your app in, at the entrance. I went and picked up my sandwich, picked up chips, picked up water. There was no cashier. There was no cash. So I went out, just walked out of the store, and I just got a bill out of the reserve saying that you know you actually you know, took these three items and we charge you so much, right? So the whole purpose, it was a seamless experience where I had to basically you know, kind of you know, go through uh, you know, the store. That the purpose was to go and get lunch, and it was not you know, to make a transaction. I didn't have to stand in line, I didn't have to kind of uh, go through the whole kind of uh, typical payment process you have to go through. So uh, all these are innovations, you know, the, the whole notion of, you know, uh, in the past, if you wanted to take a ride, you had to get into a taxi, get to your location, tell your driver your location, and then you had to basically, you know, the payment was an integral part of the whole journey. You, know, you would go in and you would spend a few minutes and give the driver cash. I have had experiences 10 years ago where the driver would say, well, I can't break a $50 note. This was my bus ride. And then you know we had to drive to a gas station, you know, buy something, break the fifty bucks, pay my driver. He would have to drop me back. You know, all of these are like you know, frictions we have in the, in the journey of life. Uh, so all those are kind of you know being avoided. And payments is becoming more and more integrated as we kind of go. Uh, when I took my ride today uh, to the conference, you know, the only thing I had to think about was getting in here. I didn't have to think about carrying my wallet or you know even carrying cash in order to facilitate the payments. So to understand what typically happens when transactions happen between, uh, you know, uh, when you go into an institution and you make a transaction is, uh, so typically these are all the key steps and there's a nice report where it's a World Economic Forum uh, called the Future of Financial uh, Services and that report actually has a lot of these use cases where we are defined. so I took some of the screenshots from there. Um, so here, 
you can see that the first step is you know the sender you know there's a transaction request from the sending bank and then from the sending bank to the recipient bank the secure message and then there is the flow of funds which is typically you know done by a clearing house and once that's done then the recipient typically receives the, the payment um, so uh, what has changed is, you know, we have a lot of new players. How many, how many of you have used any of these players? You know, Apple Bay, you know, Redbo, uh, PayPal, Google Wallet. Most of you have used these services. And sometimes you'll always be rather wondering why we're using so many of them. Because we're in the state of innovation, like, you know, different mechanisms are coming into play. Uh, but uh, it makes it, you know, an interesting experience to kind of not just use traditional credit cards, but also you know, connect it with these uh, platforms to actually uh, facilitate these transactions. So how, are, how is this kind of value being added? Like why are these different institutions coming up with these services? Uh, so when you look at the whole innovation and payment systems, there are different modes of uh, you know, payment solutions. And one of them is what's called as an open loop mobile uh, payment solution. And typically if you're using you know, Apple Bay or Google Wallet or Visa Checkout or MasterPass or any of these you know, when you look for payment options and you're trying to pay something, uh, in the past, I had to have my credit card to make an online transaction, but now I just need to remember my username and password for PayPal or you know, any of these. So that's how uh, you know, we are kind of doing things. Uh, so basically what has happened is, uh, in the context of um, uh, your payment system, so there is the enhancement of, you know, you have the, the point of sale where there's a merchant. So the payment actually you know, from the customer it goes to the issuer through the payment network and the acquirer, and then that kind of goes to the merchant. Um, so basically, uh, you know, you have newer ways in which you could actually do payments, and that's basically what's called as uh, an open loop system. But on the other hand, you have what's called as a closed loop uh, mobile payment solution. And if you have used anything like payment, you know, PayPal here or Level Up or any of these services, uh, so basically, what's happening is there's consolidation of the point of sale acquire and the payment network. So all these three components are being merged into one entity. And it basically enables or enhances the flexibility. Um, and, uh, you know, instead of, uh, uh, you know, you could still go through your traditional payment network system, but this is how uh, these services are kind of adding that. In addition to this, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, analytics being provided by uh, the vendors to the uh, point of sale of merchants uh, to basically facilitate transactions. For example, you know, in the past, payment was just a transactional activity. And there would be an intermediary who would basically say, well, you need to receive money. And if it's not cash, you know, the customer is going to pay in some kind of a, you know, a credit card or whatever it is. And then we are going to take a fee, 2.5% or whatever the <laughs> transaction fee is and transfer the funds to you. And this is the time frame to which we're gonna you know, get the tra transfer. Uh, but these newer entities are now saying, well, let's integrate the, the payment mechanism, the point of sale system, and we're gonna give you our own hardware to make those transactions through our hardware. But in addition to just getting you the transactions facilitated, we're gonna give you analytics. So for example, if you're in the restaurant, or uh, you know, uh, if you're a you know, takeout place, you know, you will actually get analytics at R by R, the amount of sales, you know, product specific sales. So in order to facilitate the business vendor to kind of leverage these analytics to make business, better business decisions, you also have data now. So instead of you just basically looking at all your transactions, and then kind of slicing and dicing, you're basically getting an enhanced service by leveraging those analytics. Okay, another one uh, is basically uh, what's called as a mobile Merchant, uh, merchant payment system. This was basically what Square and Uber and all these uh, companies are doing. And that's basically you are kind of, you know, taking this point of sale system and you're either replacing it with your own hardware or you're know, complementing or enhancing uh, this point of sale system and you're leveraging mobile connectivity uh, and, you know, instead of your traditional point of sale infrastructure and uh, you make the payment process very simple. And, you know, if you want to really check it out, you should go and check out some of the food trucks which are out there in the South Station area. You see that you know, they are not connected to the traditional networks. They typically have a cell phone and they have a gadget attached to it. And you give yourself a credit card, they have to swipe it for you. And it's just an enhanced method of leveraging your mobile phone uh, to get your payments uh, in the same place. Okay. 
So those are some of the, uh, what you call, uh, key payment methodologies. And, um, you know, the, uh, I, I, when you look at uh, what's actually happening because of these methodologies, uh, you have a lot of alternative financial uh, service providers out there. Uh, there's heavy uh, competition in terms of prices. If you look at some of the statistics, you know, uh, five years ago, the traditional credit card providers uh, were charging uh, hefty fees for facilitating transactions. And that transaction is kind of coming down significantly. Um, now, a lot of financial institutions are augmenting their traditional offerings with newer offerings just because of a lot of competition which is out there. Uh, but they also have to think about playing with some of these newer uh, alternative financial transaction providers which are out there. So you have to figure out the value chain or you know, what's in it for them to kind of facilitate those transactions if you're working with alternative uh, payment providers. Um, then when you also look at the payment behaviors, uh, you have uh, a lot of new experiences like you see the Amazon one click, right? So you see something, you get an alert on Amazon saying, uh, you should get this robotic vacuum cleaner, it's on sale. Amazon one click, it gets delivered in a day for you. You don't have to pull out your credit card, you don't have to do anything. Uh, that's an innovation. I told you about Uber already, seamless payment system. You just get into your car, get out of the car, you don't think about payment. You already have a uh, specific uh, thing already taken care of behind the scenes. Um, and then the, uh, the payment preference, you know, people typically have to think about well, if there are multiple providers kind of providing similar service, what's the differentiator, right? And uh, you know, you've uh, heard about the Apple card, and then uh, you know, Amazon has its own uh, design of a card. Uh, you know, people may think about a particular brand and you know, have a specific preference to a particular brand. Um, and then you are going to see a lot of merchant issue cards, like you know, Apple having their own card, and other vendors trying to bring their own cards into the market. Um, and then you could also see a lot of seamless integration with bank accounts. And then uh, you know, and one day when the mobile network is mature enough and most of the most of the devices have support for you know, basically having all the credit card based information in your mobile devices, you may not even require a physical card anymore. Your phone will probably be the card, which you know, kind of factors everything. Uh, so you may not require the, uh, the physical card. Um, so yeah, some of the newer things which are kind of coming into the marketplace. Okay, um, so I want to keep it a little bit uh, short with respect to payments, and there are a bunch of payment-related sessions happening. Uh, you should also check out the Federal Reserve Boston's website regarding some of their payment initiatives. Uh, they have been uh, the leaders in the space, and they've been coming up with uh, newer mechanisms, uh, newer mechanisms in the context of payments. Uh, I'll kind of leave it up there. Um, you're kind of you know getting to lending because I want to get into the case study as soon as possible. Now, uh, lending um, is a very interesting phenomenon, right? You, know, you have a whole mechanism, you know, predominantly the banks were set up to basically collect deposits, and then you had a mechanism of you know, providing loans to people, and then basically collect interest rates from people, and that was you know given as your uh, dividends or you know, your interest for you know, deposits you uh, But now, uh, you know, you're seeing a lot of interesting lending phenomena happening. Uh, so there are like two components if you look at lending. You know, one is like the uh, alternative lending phenomena which is happening, which I'll focus more about in today's session. But there's also this whole notion of equity, uh, crowdfunding and different ways in which you can raise money for startups and other entities. Uh, so I'll kind of leave that for today's session just because we have a short session. Uh, but uh, if you're looking at uh, lending particularly, there are a lot of new business models out there. Uh, how many of you have taken a uh, loan at Lending Club or any of similar peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces? So how, has anyone tried it out or know anything about Lending Club or any of these peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces? Okay, so I'll give you a brief introduction to like how it typically works. Uh, <coughs> so typically, uh, if you are trying to you know, borrow money, so when we use our credit card, basically we are borrowing money, uh, small amounts of money, right? So if I want to get my coffee, so city or whoever my credit card vendor is, is actually giving me $2 worth of milk. 
I make a transaction and I basically say at the end of the month, I'm going to either repay back those uh, $2 or I'm going to keep that loan for an extended period of time and whatever APR is, I'm going to pay interest based on the loans I'm making. Uh, lending club and other entities are basically facilitating peer-to-peer -peer lending where on one hand, you have you know, people wanting to get loans and they may not be eligible for traditional loans through banks or other traditional financial organizations. But on the other hand, there could be people with discretionary, uh, uh, they may be uh, wealthy individuals who may have discretionary money to give out loans, or you may have financial institutions or other kinds of entities who may have budgets to say, okay, let's think about it as an alternative asset to get potentially invested. And uh, you could have people lending money to each other. And uh, if I wanted to buy a boat, or uh, I want to take an expensive vacation, or start getting married, all these are reasons why people would go to an entity like Lending Club to raise money. And they could potentially say, I want $5,000, I want to repay it back in three years, and here's my story. They'll have to put in a story saying why they want to work or lend money or borrow money. And then you could have people uh, in $25 generation saying, okay, I'm going to fund $1,000 of this loan or $500 of this loan. And then once it's, uh, you know, once you have all the, 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 the money you are requesting uh, funded, then you will get the loan and then lending club is going to take part of the, the whole transaction. On the other hand, you have companies like OnDeck, which are predominantly for business, uh, business loans and uh, this is predominantly for companies who are having cash flows and they may you know, have invoices and it may take some time for them to get the money into the account. And because they may not have liquidity, they may want to go to an entity like OnDeck and raise money there. But then you could also have different ways in which you could look at uh, you know, the, the business loans itself. You know, it could be that uh, you are expecting certain types of payments in the future or uh, you may have invoices and uh, those could be your collateral for uh, getting these loans. And then you have things like PayPal working capital. And on the other hand, um, um, you have entities like uh, SoFi, which is social finance. And there you have personal loans, student loans, mortgages, and uh, you have student loan, career coach and parent loans, fixed rates, variable rates, different types of payment options. So education, Lending is also becoming a huge thing. Um, in fact, uh, you know, uh, we run multiple boot camps, you know, financial uh, uh, education, and also you know, machine learning and other kinds of boot camps. Uh, so we get like uh, calls from entities basically saying, well, we can partner with you. So if your students want to borrow money for this boot camp, so we can borrow, we can, we can uh, lend, them money, uh, lend them money for you. There are some interesting business models which are coming out there. And then uh, companies are saying, uh, well, if you're going into a graduate program or uh, some kind of an educational program, we will give you the loans and it's going to be deferred and you start paying interest rates after you graduate at some kind of a, uh, you know, traditional interest rate. Or you can potentially say that I'm going to pay 10% of my annual income for the next five years once you graduate. So very interesting business models coming out there. So you're basically saying that you're selling the rights to your future earnings for the loans you're going to be raising today. So a lot of new uh, fintech innovation ideas coming out there. Uh, but then you also have marketplaces like Amazon, where you have a lot of uh, you know, uh, players who are going in and selling uh, products through Amazon. And uh, there you could see Amazon and so it's kind of you know, putting together like programs for uh, pocket uh, merchant cash services, uh, register for your register on Amazon uh, sellers. And you have Alibaba, and then you also have Square Capital. So if you are already Square merchant, uh, so Square can potentially also give you a loan for your uh, services. So uh, as you can see, uh, a lot of uh, interesting business models are here at play. And uh, if you are thinking about like, why would someone go? Uh, well, first of all, <coughs> you know, it may not be feasible for certain entities uh, to go in and get traditional funding, right? Uh, on the other hand, it could also be a cumbersome process, you know, for someone to go in and go into a bank and then requesting a loan, you know, 
putting in the required flag. Or, or, so the whole process of uh, you know spending time to actually do that will be taken away from time you would actually be spending in running your business. So potentially people could say that I'm going to use source of all the resources. Uh, but then you could also have uh, you know uh, you know the, all these are processes under innovation. So we don't know whether you know all these business models are going to sustain. There is definitely uh, you know, risks and uh, useful report, which I referred to in yesterday's session, to actually have a nice segment on risk in terms of the risks associated with the, uh, with the ecosystem itself. And they talk about regulatory risk, they talk about some of the uh, other kinds of uh, uh, risk, for example, you know, how do you solicit these loads and uh, how does the value chain look like there? And uh, what could you know? Are there any predatory aspects involved with those kinds of uh, you know uh, interactions? Uh, but also on the on the, the loans themselves, you know, most of these are alternative to traditional uh, mechanisms of lending, right? So you don't have like uh, you know if you want to go to a traditional uh, uh, source like you know applying for a credit card, you apply for a credit card immediately there's a credit check. And they will look at your FICO score, they will look at your default rates in the past. You have history to basically tell you how have you been financially, have you been financially responsible, the payments are you been making subsequently, the defaults, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So all that is kind of captured. And uh, if you do not have a credit history, then most likely a traditional you know, lender may not even give you a credit card because you don't have the history yet. <clears throat> Uh, here, you can potentially get those, but again, there is a risk component involved, and typically the interest rates are much, much higher compared to the traditional sources because you, know, you don't have alternators, so then you'll have to pay up significant interest rates. So uh, there is definitely that uh, aspect. So, but there's also high potential for default. You, know, you go to a lending club and then you put in your story. Some of them are verified. You look at the case study and they'll talk about some you know, fields you can look for. Verification, uh, but in case you get a loan and then you leave, then that will show up as a default, and uh, there's very little you can potentially do in those kinds of uh, situations. But uh, there are a lot of opportunities too, as as the differentiation of offerings grow. Uh, there could be like you know customized offerings for different segments, uh, especially for small and medium-sized businesses who have difficulty raising traditional equity and other types of uh, capital. Uh, so you are seeing a lot of newer opportunities kind of coming in there. Uh, but then, uh, you know, there are a lot of threats too for smaller companies trying to come into the play because you have larger entities also structuring similar programs. If they see that there's a business opportunity there, they can come in with their market power and then kind of, you know, uh, create similar services. So that's a little bit about lending and payment. So um, I want to save like 45 to 50 minutes for the case study. But I will pause in here and uh, take any questions with respect to either payments or lending. Yes. Uh, this is a little off topic, but do you have any idea how uh, uh, the, the usury rate, the, the usury statutes, are they state level or are they federal or? Yes. It's both. <clears throat> it's both. I'm a regulatory lawyer. Yeah. Uh, usury is. is uh, at the state level, but um, part of the securities fraud statute is just against usury, so it's both state and federal. Okay. It's okay. a complicated role. Right. Um, she's the expert, so I'm not her. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, so let's get to the case study. And uh, uh, I'm going to orient you to the lab. So this is uh, this is one case study we want to go uh, and spend quite a bit of time just to give you an idea of what are the kinds of things which are typically done to actually build out these kinds of models. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to you know show you how to get the data, the raw data which is available on the Lending Club's website, and then we will uh, structure the part, uh, the problem. We will use some uh, machine learning components, and then we will also do performance evaluation to see how these models are going to look, and then we will deploy it, and we will show you an application which will actually uh, help you get a feel for what would it take to build out an application to uh, you know, predict interest rates. 
Now, if you have studied credit risk, uh, you, you would be familiar with a lot of different kinds of credit scoring models which are out there, traditional credit scoring models. And uh, uh, in the past, if uh, you wanted to you know, build out models, you would have models which would do things like, uh, should I grant credit or not to new applicants? So that would be a model, right? And uh, you could have models which would say, well, I've been seeing a person with, let's say, a thousand dollar credit limit has been consistently paying their credit card bills, but they are now getting close to that credit, one thousand dollar credit limit. So I should send them an offer or automatically increase their you know, credit limits. Right? So that would be driven by some kind of a model. So that could be increasing or decreasing your spending limits. Or uh, you could also have increasing or decreasing lending rates. So you could have 0%, but then the fine print is gonna say, you know, if you default on your loan, or if you don't make your payment consistently every month, you have the option to increase your interest rate to 17.99 or 27.99 percent APR. Um, so these would be triggered automatically if certain events happen, or they could potentially monitor your credit and they could say, well, you know, it looks like you have 17 different credit cards and you are kind of capping each of these credit cards. So your risk profile has significantly increased. When we gave you this credit card, you had a FICO score of 780 and zero outstanding credit. But uh, two years later, you have uh, $75,000 worth of credit. So your credit score has come down. So we're gonna change your lending rate because we won't be able to give you at the same time. So those, that could be a model. And then you could also look at alternative products. You could potentially say, well, you have been using this particular credit card for this particular period of time, but here's another potential credit card. Now, um, how do we actually you know, build out these models, right? So in the past, what would happen is you had, uh, uh, so if you go back like you know, 50, 100 years ago, uh, there's a lot of social related aspects involved. So you, know, you have like communities who would basically say, um, well, we trust this person and hence we should give this person a loan. Uh, in fact, when I took my student loan uh, for my undergrad degree back in India, uh, I actually made a call to the bank manager and basically said, well, you know, I have an account and my parents have an account with your bank and I'm interested in you know, uh, taking a study loan. Uh, can I come to your bank and can you get an, can I get an application? So I had to first get a paper application to put in a study loan application. And the manager said something point blank. He said, you are being very impolite by making a phone call. You should have come in, in person and met me. I want to look into you face to face and then see whether I should give you an application or not. And uh, you know, that was my local bank. And you know, they would run it looking at the community, looking at the society, and typically it would be someone elder kind of making that phone call or having that meeting and saying, it's for my son, it's for my daughter, and then kind of you know, having uh, the conversation going. Did you get the loan? Uh, no, unfortunately, not with that bank. Okay. Not with that bank. In fact, uh, at that point, I, I had to call my uncle, and then my uncle made a phone call to the manager, and the manager was, really upset that that phone call came from me and not from someone elder. And he basically mm -hmm. said- well, That's culture police. Yeah, it's a culture police kind of right. thing. Yeah. And then he said like, sorry, you know, I don't think you know, he should learn, the, the, the specific words, my uncle called me back and he said, uh, he should learn some manners. <laughs> that was the, was the thing. So- no, <laughs> if you go to India, they will insult you, right? Then they'll say you are so I had to go to a different bank. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that's kind of the historical aspect. So, and then again, Darshak yesterday laid out some of the things about what he's seeing in India. Um, so it's kind of similar. You know, there's a lot of societal related aspect. In fact, there are you know, groups formed and then you basically have to make sure that you know, there's a societal pressure that uh, you know, in terms of a lot of microfinance related activities, you can kind of hear about similar things. You know, it's about the societal pressure that if you don't pay back your loans, it's not just that you're defaulting on the financial aspect, but your whole society is kind of being aware of it and the pressure is gonna make you go back and pay uh, these loans. Uh, but then uh, as, as the markets mature, you have a lot of scoring mechanisms and credit bureaus and 
you have assessments, you various business rules. So it became much mature. So today, if I want to get a loan, I go in and you know put in a new clerical application, and no one's going to call me you know, unless there's something. You know, typically, I get like congratulations, you got the loan. We'll send you a credit card, or uh, no, sorry, we can't give you that particular. Loan. But then here are like the newer approaches that the peer-to-peer -peer lending in the marketplaces. And we'll focus on one of the newer approaches, which is basically peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, using the Lending Club data. So uh, for people who do not know, uh, Lending Club has been making their actual transaction data available through their website. So the, li the nice thing about uh, this particular data set is it's real data. It's not simulated data. It's not curated data, you know, which typically you would find in uh, research kind of settings, you can actually see the loans which have been made, the loans which were rejected, the reasons why people took their loans, and what kind of interest rates did they actually get. And there are also some curated data sets, and uh, if you go to Kaggle, which is a website for data analysis of data concept, you actually can download a sample data set, and you also see all kernels, kernels are basically examples of how to actually process and analyze this particular data set. So, we use this data set to kind of give you a realistic illustration of how to actually work with this particular data set. So I mentioned to you uh, earlier that typically if you wanted to you know, build out a model, these are the typical process you would have to work with. Um, so let's, let's kind of uh, you know, review some of the steps just to kind of get you an idea. Uh, and this is typically you know, when I teach uh, my machine learning and data science class, uh, I ask students to go through the entire workflow. That way they can basically understand what's actually happening in each one of these cases. Uh, so typically you're gonna get the data and you have to cleanse the data because you don't have all the information, right? For example, if someone comes in saying, I don't have a FICO score, what do you do with that? If it's a human, then they could say, well, can I look at something else? But if it's a model, then you have to make a determination whether to you know, give out certain results or just basically say, okay, I'm gonna use a proxy based on certain reasons, right? So you have to go through the whole cleansing process and curation process so that you have the right kinds of elements to build out the model. And then you also do have to do what are called, what is called as feature engineering. So there could be a lot of information uh, which may be material when you're making you know, loan decisions. And you have to understand what does it mean to actually process it. So for example, if uh, you have an application, and uh, you have something in there saying um, the number of uh, outstanding credit card loans you currently have, right? So that could be a material piece of information to figure out, well, uh, should I give this person a loan or not, right? But there could be something else which is benign. And that could be something like, you know, has there been any defaults uh, five years before the application date, right? Five years is a long time. So if there were defaults seven years back, that may not be really material for me to predict whether this person is going to default or no. So you have to figure out like what are the features which are very important to determine specifically whether to give you a loan or not, or to basically say whether this person are, you know, should be getting a particular interest rate or not. If someone's earning really well, they don't have any obligations, the risk profile is such that, you know, they may not default, then potentially investors are going to allow to fund this particular loan. Right? What that means is there's going to be a lot more supply than demand. So there's going to be a lot of suppliers wanting to fund this loan. And at that point, the variable would be the interest rate. You know, someone was going to say, you know, I would love to have 15% to fund this loan. But another person may say, you know what, this person looks excellent, the credit profile looks excellent, I can actually lend this person at 5%, right? So you could have a lot more suppliers for a loan if you, you know, have a really good profile. But on the other hand, if the profile is really, really bad, then there could be very few people who may want to lend the loan uh, uh, this particular person. But even if someone's lending because of the risk profile, they may have to charge a really high interest rate. So you have to understand what factors are going to influence your interest rate, and that's typically what's done in this context of feature engineering. Then you have to think about your building out your models, and we talked about different kinds of models. So predominantly, we're going to focus on this uh, segment, and the way we are going to structure this problem is, given a person's 
FICO score, given a person's outstanding debt, the debt to income ratio, uh, whether they are renting or uh, owning a home, whether they are currently employed, what is their total outstanding of other loans. Based on all these other inputs, what is the predicted interest rate for a particular person uh, based on the loan they're asking? So that's gonna be the way we're gonna structure the problem. And the way we are gonna model it as a machine learning problem is, we're gonna look at transactional history of all the records which Lending Club has provided in the past. And we'll, we'll build a model which will learn from what the decisions were made in the past and use that to make future decisions. So that's typically what machine learning is, right? We're gonna look at historical data and learn from what has happened in the past and build out a system which can mimic what has happened in the past. Right? So that's basically what we're gonna build out in the context of modeling. And then the evaluation piece, we are gonna try and figure out how good these models are. Because every model is not built in a similar way. So different models factor in different aspects of the features. Some of them make <laughs> very clear assumptions. For example, if you're using linear regression, you're making an assumption that your outcome variable is linearly dependent on various input variables, right? So we're gonna try and figure out, well, if I use linear regression, what's the best I could do? If I use a random forest, what's the best I could do? If I use a neural network, what's the best I could do? Compare and contrast the error rate. The error rate in this particular case, there are so many options in here, so we'll use one of them. And I'll tell you why we use that particular option. And then we'll figure out the best model, and then we will try and deploy. Okay. <coughs> so that's kind of the setup on what we're gonna do. Uh, just to kind of uh, illustrate the process, in stage one we're gonna process the data, stage two we're gonna uh, pre-process all the, uh, the data we have ingested, stage three we're gonna build out the features, stage four we're gonna build out the modeling unit, and stage five we're gonna deploy it into an application. So imagine uh, the case that you want, uh, let's say you are an institution and you have, uh, I don't know, a billion dollars in assets, and uh, you know, let's say you have a million dollar uh, you can allocate to any alternative uh, you know, assets, if you will. And one of the alternative assets you're considering is potentially being an investor in lending club. Okay. So you have a million dollars you can potentially invest in loans towards lending club. And uh, you are trying to figure out which loans should I be investing in. Okay. And let's say you go online and register yourself as an investor and you say I can lend up to a million dollars and there are 150 loan applications. And different people come with different stories and they have different profiles. Now the question is, how do you make those allocations? Because you may be coming from a perspective of, well, I want my interest, um, or my earnings to be better than a particular benchmark. Let's say a fixed income asset, an alternative fixed income asset, which has a particular default rate is gonna get me, I don't know, 5% uh, annual income. But lending club may be getting me 8% on an average, factoring in all the defaults, right? So in order to get to 8%, I may have to, you know, uh, if I'm, you know, borrowing or you know, lending at 8%, may not be, all these loans are not gonna mature. Some of them are gonna default. So I have to figure out what should be the expected interest rate I should be paying. On the other hand, I also need to know you know, what is the interest rate I should be expecting based on the profile of various people, right? So I want to build out a decision support tool and my decision support tool is what we're going to be building where I want to give the loan amount, the repayment terms, the installment, the grade of loan, the employment length, the, whether the person owns the home or is renting, what's the annual income this person. Some of these loans are verified, which basically means that person who is wanting to borrow is given much more information than Lending Club has been able to verify those uh, bits of information. And that, that could be that, you know, this person uh, has provided their, you know, has authorized getting credit reports from uh, Experian and uh, Equifax and other places. So you have much more information about the, the you know, person's past uh, behavior and stuff like that. And then also the purpose. You know, maybe you have, you know, certain 
specific goals. Like, you know, for, a, for an institutional investor, they would say, you know what, if you are doing uh, debt consolidation, you're repaying off other credit card loans by taking this loan, then I can potentially lend you the money. Uh, or if you're trying to buy something, it's home improvements or life events like wedding and stuff like that, I can lend you the money. Uh, but if someone's saying, you know, I don't know, I want to buy a boat or I want to take an expensive vacation to Hawaii. So all these, you would say, you know what, I, I don't think I should be lending money uh, for those kinds of, you know, for that kind of thing. so maybe you have specific goals you know, in your list, you would say, I'll only, um, you know, give loans to sell specific purposes. And also it depends on the state. Obviously, certain states, uh, if someone's working in a particular state, you may say, you know, I can only lend to people in the master resource area. I know the master resource area well. I understand the economy of the state. Well. So maybe I'll lend only to people in the master resource, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd say these are the things I want to kind of factor in when I build out my model. And this is all the information we already have in the Lending Club data. So we can get this level of granularity in the Lending Club data. So I could use that to train my model then build it out. Okay, so that's kind of the goal in here. And, uh, you know, we have built out a platform called as the QSandbox. And the QSandbox is basically a prototyping station for building machine learning and data science models. And what that lets you do is, you know, we leverage the cloud and we orchestrate everything on the cloud. Uh, so you don't have to bring anything internally. Everything is running on a public cloud. So you can basically fire up your experiments, you can try out things. And then once you're done with that, you can shut the whole equipment down. So you don't have to compute or do anything on your physical machine. So that's what we're gonna be using for our experiment. Um, so let's uh, get to the lab component in a bit. So here, as you can see, uh, so this is uh, how the QSandbox looks. Uh, when you go in there, uh, you have various materials like the workshops we have done. So I'm gonna fire up this uh, credit risk application. And then this credit risk application, so this is like flavor one, which is the end user app. So when you fire up this application, what you're gonna see is just the interface which you're gonna do. So this is basically what you're gonna see when you run this application. So here, uh, what's actually happening now is we're basically having a snapshot of this whole experiment um, in a, what's called as a dockerized container. And we basically fire that up on Amazon and now you have your own instance of your application running. So you can play with it and you can fine tune the application if you want, but this is gonna take a minute because now we are building the connection to Amazon and it's gonna take a little bit of time. Now, uh, the second flavor, which I mentioned to you, is uh, this one, which is the masterclass uh, we, we, uh, we did a few months ago. So here, what's actually happening is we are, uh, Give me one second, I'll just show you a case study. Okay, so what we are doing is we are basically building out these steps. We are going to initially get the data and do exploration on it. And then we are going to build out the actual code using Python. And we have a bunch of different packages we're gonna to use to build it out. So initially we're gonna read the data, we're gonna do some analysis, and then we will kind of you know, build up the, the whole model. So that's kind of what you're gonna do if you are a technologist and you wanna kind of understand the under the hood code of what's actually happening. So if you say run on QSandbox and get there, so we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll be able to do that. So let me get to the running experiments in a second. So, So we so need a password, password in here. So I'll show you a little bit of code just to get you a flavor for what does it take to you know, try this out. And if you're not familiar with the programming aspects, do not worry too much about it. 
take the big picture that typically data scientists, when they talk about using Python and other platforms to build out code, this is what they typically do. So here we are getting this data set and we are using a bunch of different Python packages. So when you look at the data, the raw data, this is what you have. You know, you have the address state, the annual income, the application type, delinquency in the past two years, debt to income ratio, if you are applying it individually versus jointly, how does it look? And all this data is available. And when you explore the data, typically you see each one of them is a past loan. So someone has borrowed $5,000 for 36 months. The interest rate was 10.65%. The installment for each month was 162.87. This was a B grade loan, has been employed for more than 10 years, is renting, annual income is $24,000, is verified. This was the issue date. The purpose was credit card is because credit card repayment. So maybe they have other high interest credit cards which they currently have, and they're saying, I want to consolidate all my high interest credit cards. Please, you know, I want to borrow $5,000 so that I can pay back those credit cards and I'm going to pay you one interest rate, which I have borrowed through lending. And then you have the debt to income ratio, inquiries in the last six months, et cetera, et cetera. So all this is raw data you have, and you can see that these are people from different states. You have Arizona, Georgia, Illinois, et cetera. So all this is the data you're collecting. And you can do some uh, exploratory data analysis. You can kind of understand how many of them are actual integers, how many of them are uh, numbers, how many of them, <laughs> excuse me, are categories. And you could also do some correlations to understand how these different variables are interacting with each other. <coughs> excuse me. So once you understand this, uh, you can also look at some of the categorical features. So you can see that uh, each one of these features have different uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, different categories. So for example, there are like close to 50 states, you know, close to 10 or 12 different purposes for different loans, employment length, uh, grade and subgrade terms, et cetera. Okay, so if you start looking at the numerical data and trying to understand what kind of data you have, you know, if you are looking at the loan amount, on an average, people are borrowing around $12,800. The interest rate on an average is 12.4%. On an average, that's going to work out to $363. And uh, you can see the, uh, the various quartiles on how it's going to look. You can also do some density plots. And you can understand the, these are the various uh, buckets of people in terms of loans. So you can see that most of them have been borrowing somewhere in the range of you know, uh, one or $2,000 to $10,000. And then very few people are asking for loans like thirty, forty thousand um, dollars. So you could basically have your model say, you know what, I'm not going to go beyond ten thousand dollars for a loan. So when I build out my model, I'm going to curtail my data for loans between zero to ten thousand dollars, and only use that data for my model because I don't care about you know, what interest rate someone got for a fifty thousand dollar loan because that's not what I'm going to do. So in the context of building data science models you can figure out like what your criteria is and filter out the data early on. And that's the whole notion of pre-processing when you build out your model to say that based on what I am going to be doing, I'm going to curtail my uh, options so that I can build uh, the best model for my specific use cases. And then you can also look at annual incomes, for example. Uh, you could have multiple dimensions you can try and analyze individually. For example, if I'm looking at annual income, you can see that most of them are earning somewhere between zero to 100,000, right? But you see this long tail, some of these people are earning 200,000 plus, right? And uh, that is something, you know, uh, you had to really understand like what these loans could potentially mean because you don't want your, uh, you know, really high earners to skew your model. So you may want to even curtail or remove those data points when you build out your models. Because uh, one of the thoughts is, if someone's earning $250,000 and is wanting a $5,000 loan, either it could be fraudulent data, they've just quoted something and it may not be real, or it could just be someone really you know, having that level of income and uh, may have some kind of a liquidity crunch and may say, you know what, I'm gonna buy $5,000, I need it in the next few days, but I'm gonna pay it off in the next few weeks. 
I'm not, you know, I don't care if the interest rate is 5% or 10 or 15%. I just need them to put cash for some specific reason. So I'm going to pay it off. So for an investor, it's basically prepayment risk, right? So if an institution goes in and says, I'm going to go through the whole process of due diligence and make this loan of $5,000, and then a week later, the person repays it back. Now I have to figure out, like, I got my $5,000 back. What do I do with this $5,000? I got like $14 as interest or whatever it is. Now I have to think about like repaying that, uh, you know, figuring out who do I lend this money to. So all those are criteria you have to think about to basically figure out, well, if these people have significant incomes and they're requesting really small loans, maybe there's something wrong in that picture. So I want to eliminate that in that implementation. So there's a lot of scope for doing data analysis when you're building out the model. So never just take the data as is and build out a model and think that, well, I've done my due diligence of taking care of all the data components. And then when you have the model, then figuring out like, well, why is my model telling me to give the interest rate at 16%, even though the profile is really, really good. Okay, so then you can see like different uh, reasons why people are wanting to borrow money. <coughs> a lot of it is debt consolidation. More than 50% of the people who are going to lending club is primarily going to lending club because they have high interest credit cards outside of the, uh, the traditional uh, thing. So most of them are saying, I want to repay my high interest credit cards. Uh, which is also an interesting thing because uh, if they are able to get lower interest rates through lending club, why not, right? Uh, but on the other hand, you could see some uh, you know, major purchases, home improvement, we are moving, vacation, wedding, etc. Even though some of them are uh, smaller segments. So I've seen people uh, basically take this whole thing and then divide it by area, so they could basically have a debt consolidation model, a credit card model, uh, you know, a vacation model, et cetera, et cetera. So if someone's asking for a vacation, you know, a loan for a vacation, the interest rates would be much higher compared to that of someone's, you know, uh, getting uh, uh, the same amount for debt consolidation. Yes, please. I don't see um, medical expenses, which is one of the biggest areas. Right, in this particular data set, they did not have that. Um, it's an interesting question because these are all like loans which were made. Most likely if it's for medical expenses, people may not have been funded because it's a high risk loan. And if someone's coming requesting, most of them will probably go for a, a source like GoFundMe. Wherein, you know, it's kind of a charitable thing and you're connecting at an emotional level rather than just being transactional, if you will. So most likely those transactions are not in here. I think it's the number one uh, cause for bankruptcies. That's true, right? So uh, for an investor, it may not be. Uh, yeah. Please. It one actually looks like it's on there on the move. You know, see where it says moving and major purchase between moving. And um, it says there, is, there is a small component of medical. Yeah, you're right. There's a small component of medical um, and this medical in here. What's the difference between debt consolidation and credit card? Um, that's a good question. Um, I have to look at it closely. Uh, debt consolidation is maybe they have multiple credit cards and they're trying to consolidate all those. Um, credit card, maybe they're just paying off full credit card. <laughs> I've looked at lending tree for uh, student loan consolidation too, so it could be other types of debt besides credit card. It could be other types of debt too, yeah, right. It could be repaying of one lending card loan with another lending card loan. Yeah. <laughs> and how this uh, all, you know, the Equifax and all, they have got compromised this stealing of the data and yeah. all. Yeah. How is that happening? Are they detected? Uh, in what way? I don't understand the question. It's, you know, for the anybody who is asking to get a loan, right? So if somebody puts the wrong information, and uh, basically, there's some case that they might have steal this information and that they put it in. Is there any way you can detect it? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if um, probably Lending Club has mechanisms if someone is like, you know, faking somebody else's identity information and trying to win. Lot, you know, so. Yeah, yeah that, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know what their verification process is. Uh, maybe, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know specifically. Because it could act as a big, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, like the, 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 I mean, like it's not only a lending club, right? Like any other platform, like any other institution will have the same problem. If somebody has, yeah, you know, personal information, the information the for place. somebody else, then yeah, so there could be other mechanisms too. Yeah. And then here, uh, uh, like the distribution by states, you can see that many of the highly popular consumers are mostly business consumers of the uh, mortgage backed applications. Okay, so uh, there's a nice tool uh, called Pandas Profiling. Pandas is basically what is the platform for uh, you know, handling data sets in uh, Python. And if you look at it, you can see uh, the individual components, individual variables, and in their uh, basically summary information. So you can kind of uh, look at each one of them. And then you can also look at the, the correlations for each one of these variables. So typically when you are working at a data level, you'll spend a lot of time trying to understand the distribution of your data, the variety of data you have, what amount of cleansing is required. And you spend a lot of time with that. In fact, they say that more than 80% of your time in building out models is spent in this phase because there's a lot of uh, cleanliness related issues in data. It's very dirty. You have to do a lot of uh, data drudgery to kind of you know, get it to a form which can actually be used for building out models. Okay, so once that's done, What's typically done is, uh, let me just uh, show you the next phase of the experiment. <clears throat> so the question now is, can I, um, can I start building out the model? So here, what we are going to do is, we are going to say, Okay, so this is the data, we have read the data, we have processed the data. So can we even cluster the data? And we can sample and cluster the data into different components. Uh, one way of doing it is by using a machine learning technique called clustering, so that you can you know, segment out similar customer, and then create profiles for similar customers and say for this whole customer segment, I'm gonna use a particular model. You could try that. Um, on the other hand, you know, we can directly jump into, uh, you know, looking at some ways of uh, visualizing clusters and saying, well, uh, what particular cluster should I be focusing on for my modeling? And there's a tool called uh, TSNI or a mechanism called TSNI, which typically helps you kind of visualize uh, and bring the high dimensions into a smaller set of dimensions in order to help you kind of figure out like, you know, what these clusters kind of look like. Um, so that's another way of, you know, looking at it. But let's focus on the interest rate prediction itself. Now, one of the things we have to think about is, we're gonna have a model which will take all these as inputs and predict the interest rate, right? Now, how good is this model? So in order to evaluate that, we typically have to figure out different metrics and some of the metrics we typically use is uh, root mean squared error, mean absolute percentage error, mean absolute error. And we'll use this notion of mean absolute percentage error. And here, what it does for you is you basically factor in what the observed you know, uh, outcome variable was, which is interest rate in this particular case, and how is it uh, when you look at uh, the predicted interest rate. And then you kind of uh, split the data into training and testing, and then build the whole model with training data, and then you know, build out the model and see how it has worked in a, in a testing setting. And the reason why I like this metric is it gives you a percentage me uh, measure. So you could have a business rule saying that, you know, I'm going to use this model only if my data is off by, let's say, 10%. So if uh, instead of predicting 10%, if I was predicting 11% or 9%, I'm pretty okay with that. And at that point, I could potentially, you know, use the results of this particular model. And when I, if I don't get that level of uh, confidence, then I'll probably have to figure out should I be doing more with the data or trying to figure out if there are other models? <coughs> so when I'm doing model evaluation and comparison of different models, I'm going to use this particular measure. Okay. Yes. Uh, aren't there tools to automate this whole process uh, for the model selection and yeah. the and the accuracy? Yeah, I'll show you an example. We, you know, like uh, it's basically what's called as AutoML, automatic machine learning. Okay. Um, so like tools like Data Robot is basically you know, oh, that's so the data robot yeah. would be something yeah. data robot is something which does exactly that uh, instead of you doing the model selection it will have a family of different models it will try 
and give you like this properly is the best model you could potentially use H2O and data robot are just examples of that. Okay, um, and then what we're going to do is uh, build out three models. One is a linear regression model. And the goal of building out this model is to say, uh, let's assume that the outcome variable is linearly related to all these other variables, and then build out the best regression model, and then figure out how am I doing. So you can see that the orange dots are the true values, and the blue dots are the predicted values. And I can see like you know whether they're close to each other or further away. At an aggregate level, we'll have to compute you know, metrics like the root mean squared error, the mean absolute error, or the mean absolute percentage error. And I'm gonna show you the comparison. Uh, so you can see that for the regression model, I got 19.33 when I ran one particular test. And when I ran a random forest model, which is basically a decision tree ensemble model, here I'm getting 6.07%, 6.07%. And for neural networks, I'm actually getting 6.56%. So when I compare, the three different models, I think you had a question yesterday. Uh, you can see that neural networks and random forests are kind of in the same ballpark. And then regression is giving me uh, a much worse uh, result. So if I were to select a particular model, I'll probably go for a random forest or a neural model. So there are all these discussions in, uh, nowadays in the context of uh, how do you do model selection? What are the various things you have to factor in when doing model selection? And you have to think, uh, whether you can just look at this metric to make your decision or should I be looking beyond just the metric. For example, linear regression will give you a bunch of factors and you can individually attribute how each one of these variables are contributing to your output, right? So for example, if I have uh, the debt to income ratio. So if the debt to income ratio is very, very high, then the interest rate is also going to be high. So there could be a linear relationship and the debt to income ratio may be contributing significantly towards your outcome, right? So at that point, you could say, well, I want to look at interpretability. Can I individually look at each one of these variables and the contribution each one of these variables have on the outcome? And then that basically I can relate to because I'm saying I'm weighing debt to income ratio by so much and weighing whether a person is owning or renting by so much and I can individually attribute these different variables. When I use random forests or neural networks, because of the complexity of these frameworks, it's going to be difficult to interpret how individual variables are contributing to your final outcome. <coughs> so you have to factor in some of those aspects when you're making decisions. Okay. So, uh, so those are uh, the three models we're going to build. And once you have built out the model, I'm going to show you how the final application is going to look like. Okay, so let's get to the next stage. Uh, in order to do that, what we're going to do is uh, show you what the final model is or how it's gonna look. Um, so this is how the final application is gonna look. Okay, so this is the interest rate predictor. So I'm gonna try it out. So I'm gonna say, uh, I want a, uh, what's happening here, sorry. I the number lock. I want a $3,000 loan for three years and then uh, up to you know two hundred dollars as my installment. Just leave the grades upgrade as is. Uh, I've been employed uh, for let's say two years. I'm renting. Annual income is fifty thousand uh, dollars. Has been verified. Purposes for moving. And then let's say I live in Massachusetts. Debt to income ratio is uh, let's say five. Past due interest is one, inquiries in the past six months too. So this is the credit card inquiries. And then the previous loan was not approved. Um, and then I'm gonna say, you know, use linear regression. And when I submit, it says that I should expect a ballpark of around 11.92% as the interest rate for this kind of a profile. Um, for, um, so, yes, please. Just curious, a number of your fields are categorical variables? Yeah, some of them are categorical and some of them are numerical. So how do you handle categorical variables and regression? Um, it basically, you do dummy variables. So one, zero, yeah, one, so you just do dummy variables in that particular case. And that's kind of factored in most uh, platforms automatically. 
So you can try out all the other options. So there are three different models. One is a neural network, one is a linear regression, one is a random forest. Depending on uh, you know, what models you prefer, you can choose that particular model for interest rates. So how did we get in here? Because these are the three models which have to be uh, parameterized, right? So you have to get the parameters for these models so that when in the context of linear regression, I'm taking all these values and multiplying it the specific weights I get for the linear regression and that becomes my outcome. Uh, but for neural networks and random forests, you have many more parameters you have to factor. So we'll kind of get under the hood in here to kind of understand that. Uh, so let's uh, go back to the code. So here I have my second notebook, which is uh, building the models. And when I look at building out the models, so here what we're going to do is we are going to get this data set and we did a bit of, uh, of pre-processing. And then these are the metrics we're going to compute. And in order to run, run the linear regression model, it's pretty simple to call Python to run these models. You are passing in the training data and the Y train is the outcome variable. X train is the matrix of all the variables, uh, which are going to be uh, the independent variables. And this is basically the dependent variable. And then you're computing the various metrics. So you can see that when I ran that as a linear regression model, I got 18.68 as my error rate. I run similarly for random forests and then for neural networks. And then when I compare the three models, I can see that the random forest and the neural network models are much better compared to the linear regression model. Okay. So now that I have my model, in Python, I can just basically use this process of pickling. It basically takes these uh, parameters and put it onto the hard disk, and now I have a model. And when the app I build, basically import my model, and I run it in, the, in, in Python again. So behind the scenes, it's all Python at this point. Okay, so that's how the, the modeling component is done. Typically, what you do is, you know, if you're working in uh, data science, you have to go through the process of queuing your model, and I'll kind of briefly touch upon it. It's not going to be the focus of today's discussion, but just to give you an idea, it's not a one-shot you know, effort. So typically you try, you iterate, you calibrate, you tune, and it's a multi-step process. You go through that multiple times till you're happy with how your model performs, and only then you adopt your particular model. So the technical term is what's called as hyperparameter tuning. There are two things you have to think about. One is what are called as parameters. When I build out a model, my model or my algorithm gives me the parameters. Hyperparameters are the specifications I provide, which is basically things like if I'm building a neural network, how many layers do I need to have? How many nodes per layer should I have? You know, what is the learning rate? What particular optimization algorithm should I use? All those are what are called as hyperparameters. I need to specify, and the model is going to use those hyperparameters to build it out. Because I have so many options for hyperparameters, there is a whole uh, way in which I can try out multiple combinations. So I could basically build out a whole grid and say, try out all these possibilities. Try with this algorithm and this algorithm, and then give me the results. I'll choose the one which is better. So because of the number of hyperparameters you can potentially use, there is obviously going to be a parameter explosion. And the number of experiments you'll have to do are going to be so many that you can't possibly look at all the possible combinations of these hyperparameters and run all these experiments and figure out the best. So that's where the whole notion of automatic machine learning is coming in, wherein people are using more smarter ways of trying to figure out, can I look at the relationship between these hyperparameters and optimize based on that and potentially use Bayesian techniques, potentially use evolutionary computing or genetic algorithms to figure out the best combination of these kind of parameters. And when you look at the platform, you know, when people talk about big data and AI and you know, it becomes like, oh, this is all cool stuff, but behind the scenes, you have to think about at this level. So companies like Data Robot and H2O are basically automating that whole process. You know, I know it's going to be hard for you to sit and build out the whole grid of experiments and try out all these combinations. So how about we do it for you and you're going to use meta algorithms to basically figure out best possible combinations. And a lot of companies are now saying, well, let's start there and benchmark what we can get to 
and whether we can do it consistently and then kind of get under the code and see what we can do build from scratch. And if we can build a better algorithm, we'll do that. Otherwise, we're going to use something which has been generated in automatic fashion. Uh, but again, there is a whole debate of you know how much of it is oh fitting, because you could potentially run huge amount of compute resources, you know, put in a huge amount of compute resources and fine tune it for what you have seen in the past. And it could just be working really well in a historical context and may not have very much predictive power. So you have to always have that balance of it's basically what's called as bias variance runoff. And you have to look at like you know how much of it should potentially be used for figuring out uh, how good is your predictive power when you build out these algorithms. Okay, so just to kind of give you a perspective, uh, I could, uh, so this is basically how a neural network would look. And, uh, you know, in order to try it out, I could basically say, let's change, you know, uh, you know, just the learning rate. And for different learning rates, let me plan out the algorithm. So I could try out different learning rates and then see what the algorithm is going to look for different algorithms. Uh, and then figure out uh, the algorithm which gives me the best learning rate and adopt that particular model. Now, in order to do that, uh, you know, this would be <coughs> based on the number of iterations and the loss function as it's called. You can see that some algorithms converge better than others. And the one which converges faster is obviously a better algorithm compared to that of one which converges slower. So you can choose your hyperparameters based on the manual mechanism like this. Uh, the other thing you could also potentially do is leverage AutoML. <coughs> So I will just show you briefly how it was done. So here, what we did was we had three uh, publicly available automatic machine learning algorithms. One is what's called a Steepot, uh, which basically uses evolutionary computing. It basically has a whole pipeline. So it takes the entire data set, it does principal component analysis, takes polynomial features, it combines those features, does recursive feature elimination, and then uses it to build out a random forest model. So it does it automatically. It requires a lot of compute power. Once it does it, it says, okay, for the best algorithm, I can give you the Python code and you just deploy this Python code. Uh, so all the things which you were asking, it basically does it behind the scenes and gets it for you. H2, obviously you've heard of H2. Uh, when you, I mean, you always have to look at the macro level and the micro level. So when you look at companies like H2 and what they do, they basically have the equipment and the machinery to basically structure these workflows and do automatic machine learning based on different algorithm choices and give you a list of potential algorithms you could use for your models. And as you know, recently they got funded $72 million by Goldman Sachs. Uh, so all these industries are now thinking about uh, everything need not be built from scratch. You could potentially componentize certain components and then, you know, build out pipelines with uh, existing tooling and uh, uh, H2 was one such example. Do, do you have some of these auto MLs on, on the queue? Yeah, yeah. Website. yeah, it's a Q sandbox. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we actually are building out a whole AutoML application, which we'll show it in the next meetup. Yeah. So Rooney is one of our developers for the AutoML example. Um, so um, Auto is um, So is another uh, application which uses uh, Bayesian optimization for uh, building out these ensemble constructions. Okay, so uh, what does it mean? Ultimately, I'll just summarize it with one graph, and that's going to blow you on, uh, blow your minds. So we started out with manual machine learning, and this was the best we could do. Regression gave me close to twenty percent error. Uh, neural network close to six percent error. Random forest was six percent error. We tried out a bunch of auto ML experiments, and H two O was giving close to like one point five percent error. Right. So this is these three are automatic machine learning, and that's kind of the power of automatic machine learning. And then, uh, you have a lot more combinations you could try and optimize it compared to that of a manual model. So that's that's the reason why many of these tools are becoming extremely popular, because a data scientist coming to, with their perspective of domain expertise, understanding the data at a very granular level, and then coming up with modeling approaches and granularly expressing the algorithms and trying it out versus a machine saying, well, I have compute power. I'm just gonna try out different possible parameters and coming up with the best possible parameters. Uh, but then there's also a debate on the other end where how much of it is interpretable? How much of it is explainable? If I'm going to a doctor and my doctor recommends a particular treatment just because the model said it, 
well, I need much more than that. You know, if a doctor says, I don't know why you should go to this particular treatment regime. And I'm just telling you because the model is telling that I don't know anything about why the model is telling you that. I won't be really comfortable going to a trade treatment regime. My doctor is just going to be, and in, you know, just basically following instructions on what a model tells me, right? Uh, but the same thing with finance, right? You know, if you are a quant and you say, well, we need to allocate fifty million dollars to this particular portfolio, I don't know why, but my model is telling me to do it. I trust my model. I have no clue, but we just need to buy all these assets. And again, that's not explainable. Either. So all those are important things you have to think about from an organization perspective. How much of it should you delegate to the machines? How much of it should you be delegating to humans? And how much of it should be interpretable and explainable? And that's where this whole notion of revolution going on or how do you understand these outcomes and the decision making models are actually doing. Okay, um, so that's, that's kind of, uh, you know, just basically the case study. We'll, uh, you know, once, once we kind of get the code, uh, you can basically take these models and run with that. All this code is made available through the Q sandbox, so you can actually try it and change the parameters. And if you are familiar with Python, you can do it. Else, you can uh, you know get to the credit risk application, which is the uh, which is the deployed application, and try out different combinations to understand how the model could potentially be used uh, from an implementation setting. Okay, um, so let me get back to the 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 final thing. I know we are close to one o'clock. And by the way, everybody is going to get access to QSandbox. We're going to send you an email with a code. That way you can try it out and you can run these experiments on your own. So you can get a first-hand you know, uh, in-person view of you know, how to run this particular lab. Okay, so time to wrap up. You know, we have spent four days and uh, we have a lot of devoted fans coming back and kind of getting the, uh, the, uh, the four lectures. I hope it was useful. Uh, just to kind of wrap up, we started out on day one with capital markets and a brief introduction to blockchain, but those were the two themes of the day. And uh, uh, D and Dushant uh, uh, gave a, a really good overview on FinTech 2020, uh, the state of the union and how they are seeing the FinTech landscape. And then on day two, we primarily focused on insure tech and uh, AI big data and analytics. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Rosenblatt had done a recent study on insure tech and they gave a, an overview of what they're seeing in the insure tech markets. On day three, we primarily focused on robo-advisors, and then uh, uh, Darshak, uh, who was one of my students a long time ago, so now he has the uh, he has a view from India, so because he's based from India, so he actually presented on what uh, the emerging trends were in the Indian markets and uh, more broadly in the emerging markets. And but today, there is still developing, you know, the, all the parameters they are trying to use. People are not aware of it. Yeah, so I mean, like, it's, it's, it's like every emerging market, yeah, that's going to be there. You know, in a practical yeah. But it is, still, it is still, it is still much, uh, it is still actually much better than what it was like five years ago. Yes, they're seeing a lot of that's true. Okay. that's true. And then today we spent uh, you know, some time on understanding the payment and the lending landscape. And uh, we looked at the credit risk case study. We can only do so much in six hours, but we have tried our best to kind of you know, consolidate all this information in a six hour time frame. If you're interested in getting an in-depth overview or if you're making a career transition or focusing on each of these verticals, we actually have what's called as a FinTech certificate program. And it's actually a 12 week program. And we spend one week on each one of these themes and we have more in-depth lectures and we have exercises on each one of these themes. Um, so we have uh, payments, blockchain, trading and investments, planning, lending, insurance, big data analytics and AI, and security. And the differentiator is, out of these 12 weeks, eight weeks is you know, lectures and labs and in-depth orientation of each of these teams. And then you spend four weeks prototyping a FinTech concept. At the end of these 12 weeks, you actually have a working prototype of a FinTech product, which you are going to be uh, either interested in scaling or trying it out. Uh, we offer this to corporates too, and we go in and we set up a framework for them. There, it may be much more contextual to the problem they're working at hand and to the data they're working at. But the goal is to basically spawn out uh, uh, an agile methodology using some of the Scrum and agile techniques to iterate and get a fintech product out within a period of 12 weeks. Uh, but for uh, in a B2C setting, we are kind of offering this for students and career transition folks who are trying to understand all these eight components and then build out a fintech product at the end of uh, 
team will help us. So if anybody's interested, uh, please, uh, you know, we're gonna start a new cohort soon. So we'll send out more information about this program. Um, and then next steps for people who are wanting to get a certificate. Um, so we will be sending out a questionnaire and a quiz to all registered participants at, uh, by mail end of day today. You can waive the quiz and say, I just want a participation certificate. I don't want to go through the evaluation criteria. And that's fine. We'll send you just a certificate saying that you were there. Uh, but uh, if you are interested in getting the mini certificate, uh, you will have to go through a quiz, which means that you have had to be present or you have watched the lectures, lecture recordings of all four lectures. And uh, then the components will pick from each of these lectures and there'll be a quiz. You answer the quiz well, and we'll grade it, and we will send you the certificate. At the time you have is uh, Monday, September 16th. You have an option to go back and review the lecture slides. And the recordings are also being shared, so uh, that will help you kind of complete the quiz. You will get up certificates on September 17th. So that's kind of the plan if you want to get the certificate. And uh, thanks so much for being here all these four days, and you have my contact information here. Hopefully this, uh, these sessions were helpful. We will send out the send, uh, uh, survey for you. Please fill it out. I hope it was useful and hopefully see you in the next uh, event, Ford University event or another big event. Thank you for your attention.